I'm, yeah, I'm just trying to complete the argument that uh, I think that's the way to, to draw it. No, but uh, a new pa QX is measured with respect to the second R, BI, and PX is with respect to alpha. I. So that's the way to view it. So the right way to do it, uh, as Anoop said, is to draw it only one-sided for Bob and do it three-dimensional just for Bob. So that's the, so that's the, the correct picture. Yeah, thanks. So let me just complete the last argument. I want to convince you that I want to convince you that the expected size of A is on the order of two to the i. So, and thanks to Anoop for the correction. And so, so the right way to draw the picture it wasn't faithful. So this is only Alice's view of the world. She has correct distribution p sub x on the odd nodes, the estimate q sub x on the even nodes, and we know that the product of those. Uh, expressions forms a distribution, right? It's just the, the product, the, the distribution. So the, the area, the total area, or the, the volume of the product of those histograms is exactly one. It's a distribution, right? Now, Alice takes, so, okay, so the volume is one because the product is a distribution, but Alice now scales this distribution, only this one, only her estimate, she scales it by a factor of two to the i, roughly, over epsilon. So the new volume is being scaled by this parameter. So the new volume, the, the, the fraction of darts, or the probability that a dart s s simultaneously satisfies alpha i smaller than px mi and beta i smaller than two to the eight times i over epsilon is just the total volume, which is now two to the, instead of one, now it's two to the eight i over epsilon over the size of the, the total volume. The total volume is u, right? But we only considered u log one over epsilon dart, right? We said we are, we're only considering these many darts, so the expected size is roughly two to the i. Okay, that's it. Okay, makes sense. So everyone's happy with the two to the i compression. Okay, I might. So maybe towards the end, if we have a few minutes, um, <coughs> we'll say a few things about you know um, a few additional things about uh, interactive compression. The obvious open problem is to to improve either of these schemes. So in particular, in my opinion, the regime where i equals log c, so if the information is logarithmic in the communication, neither of these schemes seems to produce a, a neither of these schemes performs great, right? The two to the, two to the i scheme is hopeless, right? Because two to the log c is c. So it leaves you w right back where you started. And the square root I C gives you roughly C to the half, right, in this regime. So I think, in some sense, the regime where information is logarithmic in communication seems to be a, a barrier to, for compression. And I want to tell you now about a result that has <coughs> some implications both to uh, this, re or potential imp applications to this regime of parameters. So, and it has applications to, to some security results or privacy results. So I want to conclude with this, uh, yes? Yeah, it's, a, it's an appealing program, right, to try and so I'm not sure how formal I should say this, but um, in some sense, we saw that where did, where, why did we get, um, why did we lose this uh, uh, square root? Why, where does the c to the half dependence come from? It comes from this Pinsker's inequality, basically, and the Cauchy-Schwartz, right? So in some sense, 
the fact that the statistical distance may be epsilon, but the information learned may be epsilon squared, really kills you. That, that's the fact that kills you. You could, try, you could try to avoid that if you knew in which regime of the parameters you are. So let me actually, let me present th this talk and then we can have this informal discussion towards, towards then. But yes, this, this is, uh, so, so in, this, in this work we considered the, the following uh, interactive task. So we're in the standard two-party communication setup. Alice and Bob are executing an interactive communication protocol pi over uh, jointly distributed inputs x and y. And during the course of the execution of pi, their goal is to keep an online estimate of the amount of information they reveal to each other internally um, up to any point in the conversation. Okay, so this is informally uh, the goal. And they want to do this while revealing as little as possible additional information, right? Okay, so this is essentially the, the primitive we'll be uh, looking to implement in this talk. And we will see that having such a primitive has applications to, to privacy, to uh, uh, direct sum or product uh, uh, theorems, and to uh, potential applications to, to interactive compression. And before I define this problem formally, we'll, we'll have a formal definition. Um, let, let me give you some intuition for why this, this, this task is really interactive. So I claim that estimating this quantity is something that cannot be done unilaterally. It cannot be done privately by, by neither of the parties. Okay? So the canonical or the, the simple example is the following. So suppose that during the execution of pi, Alice does the following. So pi is a very simple protocol. Alice just sends, um, Alice has a uniformly independent n-bit string. And what she does in each round is with some tiny probability, she sends the true bit xi. And with the rest, with almost, with probability approaching one, she's going to send just a uniformly random n-bit string z. Okay, so what I claim is that Bob in this case, when he observes Alice's messages, he has no idea whether he's learning something or not. Why is that? Well, simply because the distribution of z and x is the same, right? So he has no, he has no idea. When, when Bob is observing uh, Alice's messages, he has no idea whether he's observing garbage or whether he's observing an actual signal, right? This is not a, is that clear? Okay, so I claim that Bob has no idea how much he's learning. Of course, in this case, Alice knows how much she is teaching Bob, right? She knows whether she's sending garbage or not. But it's not hard to modify this example by giving Bob some side information that will disable either of the parties to infer what is the quantity that's being learned internally. Okay, so let's... There's some, some basic thing which I, which I understand. So you define the complex, uh, information complexity as, as something for the entire protocol. Now right. somehow you want to measure the longer path. Right. What does it mean? Right. Okay. So let's be more formal. Okay. So let's define the the problem, which we call the the information odometer problem, more formally. So what I claim is that we can take the information, the entire protocol, and we can break the protocol as we do the standard setup. We can break it into individual bits. So each Suppose the protocol is interleaving and in each round, each party is sending one bit. Then we already saw that we can view each, each message. Each, each message is just a bit. And this bit is a random variable where the randomness is over the private randomness of the speaker. We already saw this, right? So we can view each message of the protocol as a Bernoulli distribution of the sender, and we saw this PI occurring various times, right? So it's just the bias of the coin over the private randomness of the speaker. 
So Alice is going to send a PI biased coin in the ith round. Okay, where we know what PI is, right? It's the probability of sending a one conditioned on the history and Alice's input. And what is, okay, and what is Bob's prior on this number PI? It's just the number QI. QI is the estimate, is the probability that Alice is going to send a one conditioned on his input and the history of the protocol. It's also a Bernoulli distribution with bias QI. Make sense? So here's a question. We define what is, uh, what is the information cost of the entire protocol, but let me ask uh, a more uh, 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 fine-grade question. What is the information that Bob learns from the sample that Alice is sending MI? So what, what is the information learned in, in, in this round? So I claim that this is just the KL divergence between PI and QI. Okay, so I'm not going to prove... Right, so we are, QI takes into account the history, okay? So here's a claim that I'm not gonna formally prove that you can easily prove using the chain rule. If you sum up those divergences, then you get exactly I, the information cost of a protocol. Right, so you can view any protocol as this random walk with probability PI, it goes to the right, with probability one minus PI, it goes to the left. The information loss incurred by this step is exactly the divergence. And we take expectation over all those, over the correct distribution, over all this. Okay, so, so here we define a more fine-grained quantity, which is the information cost, or the information cost of, of, uh, of a single round, of a single message, a single bit. Okay. Right, okay, so good point. So this is, a, this is a quantity which is, it's a pointwise quantity, right? It's defined per history, per path. And this was precisely the task of the odometer primitive, right? So the point is that we know how much information is revealed on average. We know this is I bit. But we want a per path estimate of this quantity. Why do we want it? We'll see this in a second. But we saw in the previous example that, um, in, that uh, right, in, in the previous example, I remind you, Bob was sending very little information on average. Uh, Alice was sending very little information on average, but Bob would never knew in which of the cases he was, whether he's actually learning something or not. So the objective this, of, of this primitive is to have a pointwise estimate of the information learned. And this is captured by this quantity, okay? So what I claim is that in the regime where, so the KL divergence, uh, the binary KL divergence is just this definition. What I claim is that in the regime where PI and QI, the biases of the coins are around half, so they're not too biased, this quantity is roughly equal to the, uh, to the uh, difference between QI and PI squared. Okay, so essentially Pinsker's inequality is tied here. And what I claim is that Without loss of generality, we can assume that this is the case of, of that this is the case for all bits. So we can assume that all bits sent throughout the protocol are always are always not too biased. And I'm not going to prove this, but morally speaking, what the players can do is instead of sending a very suppose Alice is one, wants to send a very high uh, a very biased bit, a bit which is biased with probability nine over ten. So I claim that she can simulate this, the sending of this highly biased bit with the majority of many slightly biased bits. So instead of sending a very high, highly biased bit, she can privately draw this bit with arbitrary bias, and then she can just send slightly biased bits, bits which are, whose bias is only half plus delta, and she can send many of those, and Bob can just take the majority and recover the, the correct probability. So this is just a a simulation argument for compiling highly biased bit protocols to a smooth protocol, so to speak. And that was done before. Okay, so 
if this didn't make sense, all I wanted to assume that is that all the bits throughout the entire protocol are, have a small bias. Their bias is between third and two-third. In this regime, pin squares inequality is essentially tight. The divergence is equal to pi minus qi squared. So in this terminology, the odometer task is simply to estimate for each path t and for each point in the, along the path the information incurred along this path, which is essentially up to constant factors. We will not care about those. It's just the sum of the differences squared along this path. Okay, so do we agree that this quantity up to constant factors corresponds to the per path, to the per path information, to the divergence cost of this particular path? What are we seeing? What's the point of view? Is it the superparty? Is it analysis? So I'm trying to, okay, so I'm defining a quantity which is uh, the information cost of a, of a path, not the average information cost, which we saw. And I would like an interactive procedure that estimates this quantity for every path communicated. So, so the, you and I are, Boaz and I are executing a protocol, and during the course of execution, we would like to estimate this quantity for each point during the path. So we would like to keep an online estimate of this expression on top of it, exactly, exactly. Why, do, why are we interested in this? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say in a few slides, but is the, is the primitive problem uh, clear? And, yeah. So if you have something which is slightly different bias, then you would repeat it by using small bias. Right. Won't the error go, go up depending on the I mean, number of, because. Right, so we, so. So you have to control how many times you repeat, right? Otherwise right. So we'll, that's a good point. So we will incur an, an extra log logarithmic terms, a, a logarithmic term in the communication. So if we set the error to be, if we rep, if we send the majority, if if Bob will take the majority of log c roughly, log c over you know ten log c uh, uh, majorities, the error that the probability that he decodes the majority incorrectly will be roughly one over c, and we only have c rounds. So by union bound, this will be okay. But this is this is a correct argument. Okay, uh, yeah, this is correct. I didn't want to get into the details too much. Okay, and of course the the goal to and and remember, so throughout this talk, we ne we don't uh, unless I say otherwise, we never care about communication. We only care about information at this point. Okay, so the goal is to estimate this quantity up to let's say a factor two. So we will never care about constant factors. And of course, the goal is to do that uh, uh, using minimum additional information. So as Boaz said, the, the original protocol already incurs this much information per this path. We would like to have to know this, to, to have an estimate of this quantity using as little overhead and information as possible. And we will see later why this might be useful. Okay, so another way of saying this is that, so Boaz and I are executing the protocol pi, and the players would like to implement a, a clicker that clicks once every five bits of information, let's say, have been revealed. So just by counting the number of clicks, they will be able to, to have a, an estimate of this quantity. That's another way of, of, of saying this. But if you just consider that a separate problem, one has I, other has, mm -hmm. one has P, other has Q, mm -hmm. and they want to compute the, the square estimate, uh, the square root, the difference up to factor, I don't know, some constant factor, making, making pi I minus I Q I square information from taxes. Just this is possible or not? So computing which quantities? Just imagine one has P and other has Q, mm -hmm. and they want to compute the difference mm -hmm. with small information from taxes. What is the difference without the square, or what? 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 No, that if they compute something, it's not, doesn't matter if it's square or without the square. Just the information complexity should be the square. Sure. So if you just isolate one, one step and consider just one uh, step as a separate communication mm -hmm. problem, what is what is happening with this problem? I'm so, sorry, I'm not sure I, uh, I understand the. It's not 
okay, you have the question of uh, one has x, the other one has y, and you want to compute x minus y? Yeah, they have two numbers. Each of them has a number. One has p, and another has q. Mm -hmm. And they want to compute the difference between p and q. Oh, just the difference, the arithmetic so difference. Oh, I, see. Some factor, like, like. I see. And then just they want to have a small information complexity. So that, that's that seems that you want to do at some, uh, some specific step. So the question is, is, is it possible to do in general? Well, I'm, you're looking at the com communication, the information complexity of adding two numbers or subtracting two numbers. I guess this is one way of... I guess this is one... Notice that in, this, in our case, PI and QI are, num are numbers between 0 and 1. So, but I guess, this, I guess this is, yeah, a special case. Yeah. The, the information complexity of addition people have looked at of adding two k-bit numbers is a, is, a, is, a, is a different problem, yeah, in general. Okay, so what I claim is that the players, if they have such a primitive that costs them little overhead and in information, then if they're willing to, to pay this uh, small overhead, they will have a procedure that allows them to execute the original protocol with some layer ran on top of it that will allow them to keep uh, an online record of the information or a, a sharp estimate on the information cost of this particular path. Okay. Okay, so we already saw that we, so what I claim is that, again, by the chain rule, we can focus on just the single round, just the, the very primitive problem where we're just trying to, to, um, uh, to, to estimate the difference for a single round. So another way of saying this is that the players would like to, um, to output one or to click with probability that is proportional to the information revealed in this step. But they would like to do this while revealing roughly the same amount of, of information. Right? So. Of course, the naive attempt to do this is, well, the, the, comp the, the most naive one is for Alice to just send PI to Bob, right? Then Bob will have PI and QI, and then he'll have everything. Of course, the, the downside of this, the, this approach is that this is information, theoretically, this is too expensive, right? It's not hard to cook up examples where sending PI explicitly will reveal a full bit of information about about, uh, uh, about X, about Alice's input. Okay, so a less naive attempt is based on uh, correlated sampling or rejection sampling, which is similar to what we saw. So, not sure how many of you have seen this, but there's, there's a well-known procedure that allows Alice and Bob, Alice with probability PI and Bob with probability QI, to output a sample According to, um, according to PI, such that the, the probability of, of making an error, the probability that, so it's a, this, um, how should I say it? So maybe I better not draw. So what I claim without getting into details, since this approach doesn't work anyway, is that the players <laughs> can, <laughs> can use uh, the approach of correlated sampling where Alice has her own distribution in mind, PI, Bob has QI, and I claim they can output one, they can click with probability um, that is proportional to the statistical distance, PI minus QI, and then if they repeat this procedure twice with independent randomness and take the conjunction of those, they can output one with probability PI minus QI squared. The problem, again, is that implementing this procedure will incur too much information. It will incur information that is proportional to the entropy of PI minus QI. And this is much, much larger than PI minus QI squared. This quantity is roughly PI minus QI times log 1 over PI minus QI. So this is much larger than... OK, so these attempts do not work. And 
our main result is, is uh, an interactive procedure, in fact, a two-round procedure that uh, allows to perform this task. So the players will output, will click with probability exactly 2 p minus q squared. And the information they reveal is arguably more than what the best we can hope for, but only by a logarithmic factor. So they will, the, the, the overall information cost of this proce procedure will be roughly the entropy of pi minus qi squared. So admittedly, this is slightly, so again, notice the difference between this term and this term. This term was the leading term, the dominant term here was pi minus qi. Here we have pi, p minus q squared. Okay, so indeed this term is off by an extra factor of log p minus q, unfortunately. Um, but it turns out that this extra overhead is not, is not going to be um, important for the applications we, we have in mind. Sorry? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Wasn't I? Uh, so, so is the statement clear? So the players are, are executing a protocol. At a given round, Alice wants to sample, to send a message PI. Bob expects to receive a Bernoulli QI. They can implement, they can actually measure the information incurred by this step using this primitive with little information overhead. And T is arbitrary distribution. Arbitrary distribution, yep. Arbitrary smooth distribution. So again, I want the distribution to have the property that PI and QI are, are slightly biased. Because then we know that the, different, the divergence is essentially equal to this term. Okay, so I want to show you quickly how we, so suppose, suppose we have such a primitive, then the basic uh, 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 way in which we, act, we will use this primitive is we will just, you know, so Boaz and I will run the protocol on top of it with probability roughly one over the total information, we'll execute this prim primitive. And then by standard concentration bounds, I claim that Boaz and I will be able to keep an online estimate of the amount of information revealed along this particular path. How will we do that? We'll just count the number of clicks and we'll normalize or whatever. Okay, so this is the basic manner in which we'll execute this procedure. Just to, to kind of give you a vague idea of where we're going with this. Yes, well, I'll show this in, 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 towards the end. So let me try to uh, describe how, how we do this. So given her bias P, so Alice knows uh, the true distribution P, and suppose this is, the bias is less than half. We have an analogous argument for the other case. Alice will sample um, the following, she, she will sample a random variable between zero and one according to the following very weird uh, distribution. So Alice will have the following density, which is a function of her bias p. This is a, a, a density function on the interval 0, 1, which is this weird piecewise linear function. This, shouldn't, this structure should, shouldn't make sense at this point uh, yet. And she will just sample a number between 0 and 1 according to this density, OK? She will do this using private randomness. And she will then send this number to Bob. Okay. The communication here can be large. Remember, we don't care about communication, only about information. Next, after sending ZP to Bob, she will send a bit indicating whether her actual number P exceeded this threshold or not. Okay, so Bob receives ZP and this indicator whether her number is to the left or to the right of Z. And then Bob will respond with another bit indicating whether his number is to the right or to the left of this number. Okay, so, and that's it. That's the, the protocol. And of course, Yes. 
Okay, so, so, so is the protocol clear? So Alice will sample, will define, will sample using private randomness this weird random variable between zero and one according to this density function. She will then communicate, and then the players will basically exchange indicators indicating whether this sample fell between their, their numbers, P and Q. Okay? And they click, they output one if the number fell between, basically if their indicators disagree. Okay? Shouldn't make any sense at this point. Let's try to analyze this scheme. Okay? Let's start with correctness. So, this is the distribution of the random variable ZP. It's a, it's a function of P. And suppose that Bob's uh, uh, number Q lies somewhere here. Of course, Alice doesn't know it, right? We're just analyzing the, the correctness of the protocol. So what is the probability that this odometer pr procedure outputs a one? What's the probability the players click? Well, by definition, it's exactly the probability that this number falls between their numbers, P and Q. Right? That, that was just by definition. The players exchange indices in they output one if they disagree, which means that the sample fell between their numbers. But what is this, what is this probability? I claim that this is just the integral, it's just the area underneath this curve. Make sense? And here's where we really use the structure of this density. It's basically the area of this triangle. What is the area of this triangle? Well, the, the length of this edge is P minus Q. And by construction, the length of this edge is 4Q minus P. This is just by the structure of this, the, linear, the piecewise linear structure of the distribution. So this, the probability they click is exactly 2P minus Q squared. Okay, so maybe this weird structure is not so obscure anymore. So. Okay. Right, so, uh, so, okay, so. Why do we need this strange thing? Right? So, it, it's not strange anymore if you think of tying the loose end. So, you can think of the blue curve as defining a density over the unit circle. So, if you closed up the ends, you have two distributions over the unit circle. So, if anyone is familiar with the counterexample of the, the parallel repetition theorem, this is basically the example. So if the it doesn't. Is yeah, I uh, don't remember. I'm not. I th I'm not sure. I don't remember. We can. Let's see. Oh, I don't have. The, I don't have this. I think so. I think so. Okay. Yeah. So are, are we all convinced that at least the correctness is established? Though the the probability they output a one is exactly the correct probability up to, up to a factor two. Okay, so now it remains to analyze the information incurred by this weird density uh, function. And so there are two steps to the information cost. There's the information incurred by sending ZP, the sample, which is the main part of the protocol. And then there's the second phase where the players exchange the indicators. We'll analyze the information cost of each of those steps. And the main lemma that, I, so I want to analyze the, fr the information incurred by the information Bob learns from the sample ZP that Alice sends. And the main lemma is this, that this information is upper bounded by the, by the divergence between ZP and Z of Q. So it's the same distribution with parameter Q, which I claim is an upper bound on which, uh, which we claim is upper bounded by essentially the entropy of P minus Q squared. Okay, so, so again, I claim that the information incurred, the information incurred uh, by um, sending ZP is upper bounded by this term. Why can we do this? Well, this is the well-known principle. So what I claim is that we can replace Bob's knowledge with any prior distribution, which is a function of Q, and the divergence will only increase. This is the well-known principle that the prior, the, the projection is the minimizer of the divergence. So 
we, I claim that if you manage to upper bound the divergence between Alice's message and any prior distribution that depends on Q, this will be already an upper bound on the information that Bob learns. It's not a trivial fact, but it's not hard to prove. The next step, and this is the heart of the proof, is that this term is actually upper bounded by the entropy of P minus Q squared. Okay, so we reduced the analysis of the information of the first step to comparing the divergence between the following two distributions, the distribution of ZP and a shift of it. Okay, so I'm not gonna prove this, but again, this is similar in spirit to the proof of the, the counter example to the um, odd cycle game in the parallel repetition. If, you, if this doesn't mean anything, you can forget about it. But the intuition for this is that you can see that the piecewise linear structure of these distribution ensures that most of the times the log ratio, we're measuring log ratio, expected log ratios here, right? Most of the time the ratio basically cancels out because the number of the fraction of the time that the red curve is above the blue distribution and vice versa roughly cancels each other. This is pretty vague, but this is roughly the intuition. And we're left mostly with sublinear terms in some sense. Okay, so I'm not, that's all I'm gonna say about this. This is a, it's just a calculation. It's not uh, very hard, but. Uh, okay, so this is the first, so if you believe that the first step doesn't incur, incur too much information, let's move on to the second step. In the second step, the players simply exchange their indicators, indicating whether ZP fell to the right or to the left. And I claim that the information this step incurs is at most the probability that the protocol clicks. The entropy of this probability. So any guess why? So I claim that the entropy of the probability of clicking is an upper bound on the information incurred by this step. Why is that? Well, the reason is, is simple. The event, if W is the event of, uh, of clicking, then I, is, if W is the indicator of this event, then I claim that just by the data processing inequality, I claim that, okay, so what I claim is that the event of clicking plus Alice, Alice knowing her indicator determines Bob's indicator. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a simple fact. I claim that this tuple of event, the random variables W, which determines the click, Alice's indicator and Bob's indicator, if you know this and this, you know this one. And if you know this and that, you know. So they determine each other. And therefore, by the data processing inequality, the information that Bob's indicator reveals about his distribution Q to Alice with is at most the entropy of W. Because condition on IP and ZP, W determines this random variable. That's it. And we already saw from the first step that the probability of clicking is at most, is, is, is exactly 2P minus Q squared. Okay, so overall we get that the overall information cost of this protocol, the expectation over P and Q is on the order of the entropy of P minus Q squared. Make sense? Okay, so let's just go back to the example. And I claim that the, this primitive, having this primitive basically can, can, can salvage us from the previous example. So remember the example, Bob, with, prob with some tiny probability, Bob just sent a, you know, the true input ZI in each round. And with probability 99%, he just sent a uniform, equally distributed garbage uniform string, right? But, oh, so, uh, yes? Yeah, sorry. So, I claim that using the odometer, the players can actually uh, um, solve this problem in the sense that they can, they can, Bob can understand what he's learning and abort if he's learning too much. So suppose that E denotes the event that Bob sends the, the garbage 
string. Then, in this case, the probability that, sorry, that Alice sends the, the garbage string. So in this case, what is the distribution of, of, of x, i, conditioned on this event? It's completely independent of anything she knows, just a uniform bit, right? It contains no information, so the probability is half. And what is Bob's prior on the bit? Well, Bob's prior on the bit is always half, right? He always expects to receive an unbiased bit, no matter what, right? So in this case, the odometer premises guarantee that we will click with probability zero, right? Because we always click with this probability, and this probability is zero. Okay? On the other hand, if we're in the good event, in the informative inv event where Alice actually sends the, 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 the actual bit, then Alice's prior will be equal to 0 or to 1, depending on x. It will be completely determined by x, because she's sending x i, okay? While Bob's prior always remains half. So they will click exactly with probability half. Make sense? So by, by keeping track of the number of clicks, they can just understand in which scenario, scenario they are, and they can just decide to, let's say, abort the, the conversation if, if Bob infers too much information. Well, let's assume that PIQ are all time. Sorry? Well, assuming that PIQ are all time. Right. So, so I, I claim that there's a pre-processing step that smoothens every protocol into this regime. OK, so this is the, OK. No, no, so, so OK. Sure, that uh, the smoothing uh, process uh, basically redefines all the PI and QIs to be different ones. But I, I claim that I, cl I claim that basically the the, the same functionality for all practical purposes, the smooth protocol sim exactly simulates the the original protocol. So, yeah, but but I guess for the purpose of this talk, you can just. Take this as an assumption. But isn't there is also somehow a, a, a dangerous thing? So if, if, if a dometer clicks, this can increase the, mess, the information revealed by the next normal message somehow. Uh, oh, you, that's a good point. So you're saying that the players could potentially learn something, uh, something from the previous executions, not of the pro of the odometer itself. So there is, uh, it's a good point. So there is a claim that shows that you can always, uh, that this information can always, uh, can only, conditioning on the previous history of the odometer uh, can, only, can only reduce the information that is learned in the next step. So for our applications, we will actually use this. It's it's not a it's not a completely trivial claim, okay? So. Right. Xi is a bit. Okay. It's just a bit. Okay. So. So so the basic way in which before I describe the application, the basic again the basic way in which we implement this odometer is just we run the protocol as usual, and at each round with some small probability, roughly one over i, we just run the odometer, and then throughout the conversation, we will just keep track of the number of clicks, and we will abort if, this, if the number of clicks exceeds some threshold. This is the basic way in which we implement it. Why would we be interested in such a primitive? And, okay, so, the, so, uh, let me mention three applications. I will only elaborate maybe in, Five minutes on one of them. So the first application is, that, and actually that was one of the motivations for, for constructing this primitive, is proving this, if you remember this sharp threshold result I mentioned yesterday, last week, this w turns out that this primitive was the missing link for proving this result. Let me not elaborate why. This is, I mean, this result is a sequence of two papers, one with uh, Anoop, Mark, and uh, Amir, and the other one of this work. And this is, 
this is a, a, a complicated result, which I, I will not elaborate on, but it turns out that having such a primitive was essential to, to complete the proof for, for this theorem. So this is the first application. The second application has to do actually with privacy. And um, basically, I claim that the odometer enables in some sense to have the optimal secure information theoretic uh, privacy guarantees that one could expect. So um, it's not hard to see that if the information cost of a function in the honest setting, when, when Alice and Bob are honest, if the information cost is at least 10 bits of information, you can view this as a privacy measure. There is no way to compute the function with less than i bits of information, even if the parties are completely cooperative and honest. So you cannot, you can never hope for a better guarantee in the malicious case. What I claim is that the odometer actually enables us to retain the same amount of information even if one of the parties is malicious, as we saw yesterday. So I will not formally claim this, but uh, uh, um, because I, I'm running out of time, but what I claim is that you can actually, it turns out you can actually implement this odometer primitive even in the setting where the other Alice's, one of the parties is malicious in the sense that you can keep track of the information the malicious party is sending and you can always abort if the malicious party is only trying to fish too much information. Of course, the, the non-trivial and the very surprising thing to prove is that you know, the malicious party could try to cheat the odometer. It could try to pretend that it's not learning. Turns out that this is not possible. This is, a, this is the, maybe the, the, most, uh, the, the most complicated claim in, in, in the paper, but uh, if you're interested, I'll be happy to, to elaborate offline. So I, wa I want to mention, so the point, the point of this result is that it's completely free of any cryptographic assumptions. So there is absolutely no crypto cryptography involved in this uh, assumption. So as far as we know, this is the first information theoretically secure uh, um, protocol under no cryptographic assumptions that essentially achieves optimal, you know, the best privacy guarantees you can hope for. You still assume that malicious party had the same Y and the distribution is, 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 is the same or just malicious yes. party is arbitrary and tries to do something? That's a good point. So one, one, one could, so so one, one thing the malicious party could do, which is something we can never rule out, is pretend to have an input Y, which is different than our true input, and, and this Y would lead to a very high information path in the, in the tree. Right? This is something we can never rule out, right? because this, is, this scenario can actually happen even in the honest case. Even in the honest case, there is some probability that Bob receives some input Y that will lead to a very high informative path. However, using, using Markov's inequality and, 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 and those things, we know that this highly informative path does not occur too often. So the, the point is that we always measure what the malicious part is actually learning with respect to her true input. But it turns out that she cannot cheat this procedure. So the only way in which she can cheat the odometer, namely not clicking, so, Bob, so Alice will think Bob is not learning anything, the only way she can cheat the odometer is by not learning too much. Or in other words, if, if Bob is trying to maliciously learn a lot of information about Alice's bit, the only way in which he can fish a lot of information is by hastening the termination probability, hastening the probability of clicking. This is a highly non-trivial claim. It's like a, a five-page proof. It's, this is the heart of the paper. It shouldn't be obvious. Okay? Almost, so we use the same odometer with a twist. With probability half, we reverse the order of, 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 of senders. Because if we keep the same order, Bob can always say, oh, I'm not gonna click, and then he learns information for free. But if we, with probability half, we exchange the order of speakers, it turns out that with probability at least half, Alice will catch Bob if he, he's trying to cheat, if he's trying to, to lie. This is the very high level intuition, but that's, let, let me, I'm happy to, to, to speak about it offline, but this is, yeah. Okay, and the, the very last application is to interactive compression. What I claim is that essentially, 
the protocol, what, what the odometer primitive allows you to do is to chop up the, pro the protocol tree into chunks that each one reveals roughly log, log C bits of information. So this is the regime I drew there in the picture. So without getting into details, I'll just say that the odometer essentially reduces the interactive compression problem to compressing in the regime where information is roughly logarithmic in communication. So if you manage to make any progress in this regime, this may lead to general improved interactive compression results. And yeah, so yeah, let me just, yeah, end here. Thanks.